You're listening to the podcast of the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm Matt Bergman. Our guest today is Jamie Settle, an associate professor of government at William & Mary and the author of Frenemies, How Facebook Polarizes America. Jamie Settle, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. So your book, Frenemies, uh, posits a, a connection between social media usage and political polarization in the U.S., Um, A lot of political scientists have recently been attempting to figure out what is causing political polarization. Um, What does your book add to that conversation, and does it challenge uh, the conclusions of any uh, previous studies? So I think that a lot of the previous research on social media trying to look for political polarization was focused on attitudinal polarization. They were trying to figure out if when people use social media, if they became more extreme in their viewpoints, or if they were gravitating towards having more more connections with like-minded others, say. And what I really focus on is the effects of social media on psychological forms of polarization. And so that's thinking more about the attitudes that people have of others, not necessarily whether their viewpoints on current policy issues have become more extreme. So I think my contribution is to say that the the way that people are using social media may have effects that are are wider than simply changing their attitudes about politics, that it can change their attitudes about their fellow citizens. And it also pushes back a little bit on this idea that we should only be looking for effects of polarization um, based on things that could be measured on, on a platform, say. It says that there's a lot of room to think about what the psychological mechanisms are of using the site in terms of affecting these interpersonal attitudes. In your book, you write, quote, the defining characteristics of political communication on the Facebook news feed are uniquely suited to facilitate psychological processes of polarization, uh, including identity formation and reinforcement, biased information processing, and social inference and judgment. So can you can you tell us what the characteristics of the new news feed are that that lead to those processes and and how they lead to them? Sure. So the the argument is that this distinct form of political communication that happens on the Facebook news feed um, is well suited for these various processes. So for example, um, identity formation and reinforcement. The whole purpose of Facebook communication is to share with your social connections who you are and what it is that you're doing. And so that's inviting you to to post to the world and and express um, aspects of your identity and who you are. What I think a lot of people don't realize is that because we live in a country that is has sorted all of our identities together so that our racial identities, our religious identities, our political identities, often our geographic identities are all sorted in ways that when you share details about one aspect of your life, you may be signaling to people unintentionally other aspects of your political viewpoints. And so you're communicating who you are. So for example, you know, you go uh, to the farmer's market over the weekend, you post to Facebook, uh, you take a picture with your organic produce in front of your Prius, and you talk about what a great Saturday morning it was. You don't think you've communicated about politics, but all of those signals together reinforce something likely about the, the political views that you do have. And you're expressing that, and then because of these quantification aspects of Facebook, you're getting positive reinforcement for those aspects of your identity. What the the consequence of this is, is that people are signaling information about their political identities inadvertently on a regular basis. Um, And that interacts with the structure of people's social networks in a very interesting way. So most people on Facebook tend to be friends with others who share their political views. We know this is true both online and offline. But what's unique on social media is that you also tend to be friends with your weaker social connections and you're less likely to share political views with your weaker connections. They're gonna be a more diverse set of people. But the way that Facebook algorithms work is that you're more likely to see people that that share your views, right? That your closer connections, the people you communicate with more regularly, you're more likely to see what they're posting on Facebook. One way this biases your information processing is that this 
increases your, your perspective that most people tend to share your views. You're being surrounded by people who, who tend to believe the same kinds of things that you believe, but you're not given the full denominator, right? You don't get a full sense for just how many people might uh, not share your views. Another way to think about this is a news article that gets posted. Um, you see all of the people who comment on it or all of the people who choose to like or share the article, but there's no way to see the, the full set of people or the number of people who might disagree with it, for example. And so what's going on then is that there are these subtle biases that act uh, in ways to make you think that your viewpoints tend to be more in the majority. This also is complemented by the fact that the people who tend to talk explicitly about politics on Facebook tend to have the strongest viewpoints, right? It's the people who, who uh, care the most about politics and are most willing to share their ideas who are the ones who are actually talking about politics on Facebook. And when you're thinking about people on your own side, you know, your co-partisans, you know a lot more people on your side of the aisle. And so you can recognize that the people who are talking about politics on your side maybe are, you know, a bit more extreme than the average on your side of the aisle. But when you see people on the other side talking about politics and you, uh, you know, hear what they have to say, because you know fewer people in this outgroup, you aren't able to situate them accurately whether or not their viewpoints are representative of their group. And so you make this leap then that that extremist is the prototypical member of your outgroup. And that leads you to believe that there's more difference between your side and the other side because you're only being exposed to the extremists uh, on, on both sides. And we know from a process called social identity theory that once a group identity is uh, recognized and reinforced, that we tend to see more distance grow uh, in people's perceptions of those two groups, even on dimensions that have nothing to do with what separated the groups in the first place. And so this is why we see that once people recognize their in-group and their out-group with respect to politics online, it tends to lead to this social inference and judgment uh, where they become uh, very stereotyped in their thinking uh, about, for example, the, the quality of information that people use or what people tend to know about politics. Why can't somebody who I know in real life, uh, who I'm friendly with, but who, uh, you know, we have very different politics, uh, why can't that person see a post that I make on Facebook and say, hey, you know what, that's a very well-reasoned, well-thought-out uh, point of view that I had never thought of before, and I, instead of, you know, doubling down on my own position, I'm going to, to change or modify my, my politics uh, in light of this new information. Why can't that happen on Facebook? Why does it always have to be these kind of this reinforcing, mutually reinforcing polarization? So that has to do with the format of communication on social media, which is just not conducive for well-reasoned, nuanced expressions of viewpoints. The kinds of communication that's incentivized on social media tends to be short, it tends to be pithy, it's often right one or two sentences that accompany the posting of a news article or a meme, for example. When people do write out longer form viewpoints, sort of trying to, to analyze more deeply what their, their opinions on something might be, um, those don't tend to circulate as widely. They're not uh, liked and shared and they're less likely to be seen by other people. I think the other thing I should point out is that where real learning about other people's views come from is about the friends of your friends. So the people that we know well in the offline world, we probably already know what their political views are. What's going on on social media is that we're able to see the friends of our good friends communicating. And these are people that, you know, we have a name, we see their name on Facebook, but we don't really know them as individuals. Um, but Facebook allows us to be a fly on the wall, essentially, and we can see people communicating with their in-group in a way that's just not possible in the offline world. You don't have the opportunity to see a bunch of people that you disagree with, but who all agree with each other, talk about politics, right? In the real world, your very presence would change the way that they're talking about politics. Hmm. 
So how did you how did you empirically measure all this? How did you distinguish cause from effect? How do we know that Facebook is actually intensifying polarization rather than simply kind of reflecting an intensified polarization in the outside world? Yeah, that's a great question. And and I'm careful to to state that the kinds of evidence available makes it very difficult to have a perfectly clean causal story. Um, for one thing, the, the survey data we have available over time where we would want to see um, changes over time, for example, people who, you know, as they adopt social media become more psychologically polarized, we just don't have the kinds of survey data available that would allow us to look at that. Um, the other problem is that most people, you know, most Americans are using Facebook and the people who are not are going to be very different than, than the people who are. And so it's it's difficult to, um, to get that perfectly clean causal test. And so instead, the argument I'm making is I'm demonstrating that the process of using Facebook can be polarizing. And so I did a series of studies showing uh, how people evaluate the content that they encounter online and ask them to assess their own networks and, and uh, report back to me some of the attitudes about people uh, within their own social networks. I also did a survey that um, compared people uh, who don't use Facebook to those who do and found that people who use Facebook and use Facebook more frequently are in fact more psychologically polarized. They see greater differences between people and they hold more stereotypes about the out party. So what led you to focus on Facebook in particular uh, and not say Twitter or YouTube where we, we know that millions of people get their information from? So at the, the time I began the project, um, Facebook was definitely the, the dominant form of social communication among people who had some actual connection to one another, actually being friends or professional contacts or friends of friends. Uh, and it's still considerably larger than Twitter. Um, a much greater proportion of the American public uses Facebook than uses Twitter. And I also think there are some really interesting aspects about Facebook in addition to its, its dominance and in, in terms of you know, market size. Uh, the idea that the connections you have to other people are bi-directional, that, that you have to request someone to be friends with you and they you know, have to agree to that. Um, I think it's also really interesting that the site wants you to be your authentic self. It emphasizes, you know, you have this profile page and it encourages you to, to share things about your life. Um, whereas Twitter is, is often used much more for communication about news and politics and culture uh, and, and a bit less so, I think, about sharing the personal details of your life with the people you know who are going to care about those details. Um, I would love to, to think about how this project could expand to other social media sites. And I think that you're right that um, YouTube is an area right now that deserves a lot of attention. At the end of the book, I break apart the features of Facebook that I think matter most to think about how we should evaluate other platforms. You, we, you want to think about what features are driving these phenomena and how those features work in combination with one another to get a sense for what our predictions might be for other platforms. Hmm. Well, as a professor, I've noticed that uh, not many of my Gen Z students are, are using Facebook. They tend to prefer these more visually oriented platforms like Instagram or Snapchat. Um, so I don't know if that's a real trend, but if it is, how do you think that, that especially this visual element uh, might affect political communication? I think it's huge. And I think generally speaking within political science and political communication, we haven't studied the role of imagery in videos enough. Um, I think it's important to recognize how much more information can be conveyed in a picture or a video than simply text. And so there's a lot more rich detail that's communicated about who we are. We also shouldn't underestimate the extent to which our identities can be politicized. So I gave a, a talk a couple of years ago to a group of students and, and at another university, and one of the students came up afterwards and wanted to know you know, if I had thought about the fact that sometimes when people are posting a picture, 
they're not intending to signal anything political, but but other people are reading it as political. And what they meant is, you know, they were in a same sex relationship and had just posted a picture with their boyfriend out, do you know, going about their weekend activities and didn't mean anything of it but had people in their social networks who read that as some sort of uh, statement about their political viewpoints. And so I actually think that there are going to be um, new but you know, equally important issues to be looking at when we think about the visual representation of identity and how easy that is to politicize in our culture. So assuming that we all agree that political polarization is a bad thing, uh, what can these social media companies, uh, Facebook in particular, do to try to you know, mitigate the problems that they have been contributing to? Yeah, that's a tough question. And and I think that it's more seriously considering um, what their features, what their affordances are actually doing. They have optimized their platforms for revenue goals for the most part, right? They're trying to generate user engagement in order to drive up advertisement prices. Uh, and And I think that it's taking a step back and weighing what the cost of that is versus changes that um, might lower user engagement but lead to an overall higher quality of user experience on the site. And I think that a lot of platforms are are taking this very seriously. Um, There's been immense growth uh, in hiring from social media companies uh, for social scientists, uh, including qualitative social scientists and and, uh, survey-based researchers who are really trying to dig in to better understand the user experience in ways that can't just be captured by metrics on the site. Uh, And so I think thinking about those trade-offs, right? What, What would it mean if we were to, for example, Um, hide the quantification of posts. We know that that's going to lead to a drop off in user engagement to a certain extent, but do people actually have a a better overall experience with the site uh, if they're not being exposed to quite so much quantification? Do you think that there's a role for the state, for the government to play uh, in taking measures, either measures regulating social media companies to try to reduce these polarizing effects in some way? And it might not be directly related to this question, but I wanted to ask you also about uh, Section 230 of the 1996 uh, Communications Decency Act, which President Trump has recently uh, called for Congress to repeal. Uh, The the provision of this law uh, protects social media companies from uh, any legal liability for uh, posts that might appear on their forums. And so I'm wondering, you know, how do we think about this and President Trump's opposition to it? Uh, with respect to this question of should we regulate social media uh, in order to uh, depolarize the country? Yeah, that's a huge question. So I'm going to to leave off to the side these questions of Section 230 and the idea of the circulation of um, mis and disinformation. I certainly think that there might be a role for regulation in that space. But the crux of what I'm studying is is people who are using the site in the way it was intended to be used, right? Personal expression, statements of own viewpoint. That's kind of um, classic, uh, you know, true First Amendment being able to express what you want. And so the question is, there's always that fuzzy line in terms of of determining when someone's speech has crossed a line uh, and, and should be regulated based on, you know, precedent that has been set in the past. But what I'm talking about is is really not that kind of questionable speech. It's really more just identity communication. And I don't think there's a role for the state in regulating that. Um, But clearly there is a, a desire to have a higher caliber of democratic deliberation. We want people to be able to communicate with each other more effectively. Um, But in many ways, this starts from the top, right? We need to see our political leaders communicating in ways that we want to emulate. Um, It's no surprise that if our political leaders um, speak the way they do and and aren't willing to compromise with one another and aren't willing to put, uh, you know, the good of the country above the, the needs of their party, it's not a surprise that people are emulating this behavior and communication that they're seeing from elite actors. So I don't think the answer is regulation for the kind of speech that I'm focused on. And I think it has a lot more to do with reconsidering the the norms and decency in our political communication from the top down. 
I take your point about uh, the difference between the the disinformation piece and the polarization piece, but isn't there uh, some kind of link between the two? Doesn't uh, the proliferation of uh, disinformation in, in, increase polarization? And how can you really disaggregate those two things? Right. So I tend to think of it the other way. I think of it that the the forms of polarization that I'm talking about, the climate and this the ecosystem of Facebook has actually made us um, ripe to be taken advantage of as a society by all of these quote unquote bad actors. And so it's the fact that we've become so polarized. It's the fact that we have lost a lot of social trust and we have lost trust in the media and lost trust in our institutions and perceive our opponents as being threats to the well-being of our country. Those are all things that make us very ripe to be exploited by actors who want to disseminate disinformation in our society. And so, yes, I think it's a, a huge issue, uh, but I think that thinking about this broader issue of the climate that's created, uh, we need to deal with those root causes separately than thinking about uh, what we need to do to, to actively stop mis and disinformation from spreading on the site. And has Facebook actually responded to any of the academic critiques that you're making uh, by changing things that they're doing on the website? Definitely. So they have spent uh, a lot of money uh, funding independent research, outside researchers in looking at a lot of these questions and have hosted several conferences um, trying to better understand, uh, you know, getting the perspective of these outside researchers in terms of what the consequences of site usage might be. So I think they're taking this problem very seriously. Um, they're also looking for ways to, to fund this kind of basic science research uh, in order to um, you know, support support the research community to get the best quality information they can, because uh, I, I think they recognize that not only is it an important topic from the perspective of our democracy, but it also matters for their bottom line, right? At the end of the day, they need users to continue using the site in high numbers and for high uh, duration and, and length of time. And so um, they do care both for, uh, I think, reasons related to, you know, the normative good big picture, but then also for their financial bottom line. And maybe on that note, do you have any response to the recent antitrust uh, uh, suit brought against Facebook on the grounds that it, it is a monopoly? And if if uh, Facebook is broken up into different entities, what will the ramifications of that be for uh, the way we communicate political communication? Yeah, you know, I, I will be interested to learn more about what evidence has been gathered in terms of this, um, you know, what, what they're accused of in this filing, essentially. But in terms of the ramifications of the company splitting up, I actually think there's a lot of danger there. Um, my understanding is that if, if the company did have to split, um, WhatsApp and Instagram would be on their own in many instances in terms of redeveloping a lot of the protocols that have already been developed to deal with uh, mis and disinformation, to deal with bots and to deal with trolling. And so I think certainly in the short run, the quality of the user experience would go down. Um, and, and Facebook right now has a lot of resources that it's able to direct towards these problems. But if you split the company up, um, smaller companies that may be more likely to emerge and may be more likely to be successful are certainly not going to have the resources to try to direct towards understanding these big societal collective action problems. And so I think it's a bit short-sighted to think that breaking Facebook up is going to fix a lot of these problems. Since the election, we've actually seen um, some conservatives uh, switching from Facebook and Twitter to new, more conservative, right-leaning sites, social media sites like Parler. And I'm wondering if you think that it's possible that that could become the new phenomenon and instead of kind of... Uh, reinforcing our identities against one another on a, a shared forum like Facebook, uh, we split into ideologically specialized forums. And would that be better or worse? 
So one really important thing to remember is that most people do not get on social media in order to engage about politics. They want to be on the social media platform where their friends and family are in the case of Facebook, or perhaps where they can get the information they're looking for in, in terms of YouTube or Twitter. And so the problem that I see with sites like Parler uh, is that it it is at the outset likely to be unfriendly to half of the country. And so someone who's looking to stay connected with the people they know are unlikely to, to find the full set of friends and family they're hoping to connect with on a site like Parler. So I don't think that's to say that that Parler will necessarily fail. I just don't see it likely to displace a site like Facebook um, because fundamentally people are not driven by the desire to communicate about politics when they're getting on social media. And finally, uh, you're working on a second book project right now. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So this is a project I've been working on uh, for several years with uh, a former student of mine who's now an assistant professor at Wash U. Her name is Taylor Carlson. And we're really interested in understanding the social and psychological foundations of face-to-face -face political communication. So we've studied political discussion for you know, a long time, and we understand a lot about the patterns of discussion and the fact that people are more likely to talk about politics with others who share their viewpoints and that people who talk about politics are more likely to um, participate afterwards, for example. But um, we don't have as good an understanding of the actual psychological experience of discussion itself. And so we break this apart to think about questions like, um, how do people anticipate whether a conversation is likely to be agreeable or disagreeable before it might begin? Basically, how do we know what conversations are likely to be friendly or not friendly, depending on our views? Um, are people honest in expressing their true opinions in a conversation, or are there circumstances in which people might censor their viewpoints or conform to the, uh, the opinion of the group that they're talking about politics with? Um, what are the, the consequences of this trade-off where you don't want to sacrifice your social relationships with people, but expressing your political viewpoints might be very damaging to those social relationships. Uh, and so we unpack these different stages of discussion uh, and think about some of the ramifications of what this, this uh, in many cases, psychologically distressing experience is in terms of people's attitudes and desire to continue to talk about politics in the future. Well, that seems more relevant than ever. Uh, Jamie Settle, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me.